Good afternoon, folks. We're going to talk today, or I'm going to talk today, and then <laughs> you're going to talk back to me, hopefully, uh, about um, static mockups, about the absurdity of using images uh, to design websites. So my name is Mark Conroy. I'm a lead front-end developer with a company called Anertech. We're the largest Drupal agency in Ireland, and at the moment we have the accolade of Web Agency of the Year. Uh, at DrupalCon last year we won Web Agency of the Year, and the best website in Ireland, and most beautiful website in Ireland, and lots of lots of nice awards. So we, we think we're kind of good at what we do. I'm also the uh, chairperson of Drupal Ireland. So if you came to DrupalCon last year, and had a good time, you might come along to Drupal Camp uh, next month. Uh, I'm an admin on the drupaltwig.slack.com. The Drupal Twig Slack is the kind of the front end Drupal, uh, the front end Drupal uh, Slack. Uh, if you're looking for front end knowledge, it's a great, great, great resource. It, it's a, you know, you ask a question and usually within five minutes somebody will at least tease out the, the question a bit with you if you can't get an answer. Um, one problem we do have with being Slack is it's the free plan and we lose lots of knowledge as well. So if you do join it and you ask a question and you get an answer, please write a blog post so we, we, we can kind of archive the knowledge somewhere. Um, I'm also working on the out of the box initiative. So I'm, I'm, I'm part of the team implementing the team for the new team for Drupal Core as, as part of out of the box. And I'm Mark Conroy on Twitter. So today, here's what we're going to look at. Uh, a quick kind of overview of uh, you know, the problem, what goes wrong when we use static mockups, and you know, why should we not use Photoshop, and why should we not use InVision, and why should we not use Sketch, and things like that. Uh, then we look at uh, what is the solution. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to rant and complain a lot about Photoshop, but we might as well have some sort of a solution or some sort of thoughts about how, how we can solve the problem. And after that, then we will look kind of a, a bit more detail at atomic design and specifically at Pattern Lab and how Pattern Lab integrates with Drupal. So this is me. This is the day we won a nice contract. And I'm fairly happy. My dog is, dogs are dogs, I guess. But I do the developer thing then, we win the contract, we're going to build a new website, and I become a code monkey, and I start writing my code. So this is uh, me writing the code and being productive and thinking that, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing it right. But the contracts often come with the kind of contracts we, we work on, and, on, on fairly big contracts in two stages, so there could be a tender for some company to design a website, and a tender for some company to build a website. So often we win the contract to build a website. We don't have a large design team, uh, so we often don't win the design aspect of it. So this happens. We meet the client and they tell us they've got designers and it's a great design agency and often it is and they've won lots of awards and they tell us, yeah, we'll deliver the uh, PSDs, the Photoshop documents. Or, oh, God, PDFs or, you know, <laughs> this, <laughs> this kind of crap. And uh, I get frustrated. But eventually, after some thinking about that, I realized, ah, hang on, hang on, hang on, we can, we, can, we can fix this. So I had a eureka moment. So we're, we're, we're going to try to solve it. So here's a quick little exercise. I'm going to guess this sounds familiar to uh, certainly the front-end developers here. The back-enders might not realize the pain we go through. Um, so this sounds familiar, let me guess. You, you, you get some designs. Is this showing up here? And the client uh, signs off designs and says, yep, this is exactly what we want. The spacing is right, the line height is right, the uh, imagery is correct, everything is on brand. And then you build a website based on these designs. And the website that you build, it looks um, quite like the designs. It's not exactly like the designs, but it's quite like them. I mean, from the developer point of view, it's exactly like the designs, except uh, the designer used uh, five words in every single blog post title. And yours doesn't look exactly like the designs because you have one blog post that has six words in the title and one that has four. And the client can't understand why different words look different. <laughs> 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 and these are, these are real problems. I mean, we, can, we can laugh, but these, these things happen. 
So that's not the, the, the um, it's not the client's fault <coughs> that this isn't exactly as it should be. And it's not your fault that it's not exactly as it should be. You've, you've built what you were asked to build in the manner that you were asked, you were asked to build it. But you know, it's, it's a, I suppose in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion, I shouldn't say it's someone's fault, it's something's fault. I'm going to say it's someone's fault. So someone's, someone has made a cock up here and I think that is the person who used Photoshop. So here's the problem we have. So websites in the real world use real content. An example of, 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 of this becoming an actual real issue for a client of ours recently we were, we were working with, the designers used five words in the title of every single nose, node uh, news uh, uh, news um, view. Lorem, Ibsen, Dollar, Sit, Amit. Okay, every uh, news post, every press release, every person's name <laughs> was these five five uh, words. And I said, what happens if there's more than five words in a news post? We would look at their present content. See this uh, news post here. This has 26 words in the title. This one here has 17, so you know, they're, they're, they're long kind of uh, government things where you have to mention all the ministers and the councillors and that in the, in the titles. Um, so the designer said, we're, we're going to train the client how to write shorter titles. And I said, okay, here's the client's name. Vienna City and County Council. Okay, the client's name alone has five words. Now the day the website goes live, you're going to tell me you're going to train them to write titles that are less than five words when the first news post they're going to write is Vienna City and County Council launches new website. So we've got a problem when we, when we, st when we start working with real content, we've got a problem and Photoshop can't really solve that unless the designers are willing to copy and paste in all the different uh, titles and, and, and lengths and things like that. The next problem we've got then is that these are, these are just static um, Im images. They, they, they can't be tested on proper devices. They can't be, like you, you send a mobile design to your client, you can be sure they'll open up that in a desktop and have a look at, oh, this is going to look great on the phone on my desktop. Uh, you send them desktop designs and they're traveling at the time, so they open it up on an iPad and say, oh yeah, my desktop design is going to look great on an iPad. Uh, on top of that then, if they design them for 1200 pixels wide, they're only seeing just one representation. They're seeing exactly what the website will look like when it's 1200 pixels wide, not when you're on a 22 inch monitor, not when you're on a 50 inch monitor, not when you're on your watch. You know, not when you're opening your fridge and there's, you know, if whatever internet of things kind of are, are connected. Um, so it's basically, you know, to, to, to make it uh, short, uh, what you're doing in effect is you're showing your client that this is the most effective way that I can make sure that you will never have the website that you think you're having. Um, I actually don't know who Stephen Hay is. <laughs> I found a, a, a file with some notes for this presentation and I don't know where I got that quote from. So thank you Stephen if you're here or <laughs> wherever we got it from. So here's uh, uh, two examples of Photoshop layers. <laughs> this was uh, from a blog post we wrote called Design Wars. If you see the one on the bottom left, it's called Doc1. It's uh, Microsoft outputs .doc for doc files with uh, lowercase letters. So somebody actually had to go to that and edit that and decided I would prefer to call this doc1 with capital letters. Uh, we've got subheading 2 and we've got layer 29. Now how I'm supposed to find the correct things I want to find in a timely manner, I don't know. So we end up going over time and we end up going over budget. This one here is from one of the best design agencies in Ireland. Uh, we do a lot of work with them and they are absolutely fantastic and we really like working with them. But their layers are called, or their groups are called group. And inside group we've got group. And below that we have group, and below that we have group, and below that we have group. You can see where this is going. So this, this doesn't lead to a, to a nice workflow. Now we've had some meetings with them and we're talking about you know, how do we make handover better and how, how, how can we make things more enjoyable. Um, and that, that's, that, that's great, so it's, it's, you, know, you, you, can, you can massage your, your uh, designers somewhat. So um, basically, when we're, <coughs> excuse me, when we're talking Photoshop, we're saying the function of Photoshop is in the name, photo. It's an image manipulation tool, you know, it's not a design tool, it's, it's, for, it's for adding lens flare to buttons when you click them that you can't implement when you're, when you're a front-end developer. It's, it's for uh, cropping out um, 
uh, the sunshine or cropping out electrical poles in, on, on, on a nice view. It's not for designing websites. It just happens to be getting used for designing websites. So we need to move away, away from that. Um, one very uh, common thing that happens with me is I'm working on a Mac and my Mac system renders fonts in a certain way. Uh, Photoshop renders fonts in a certain way. Chrome renders fonts in a certain way. Safari renders fonts in a certain way. They all look fairly similar, but there, there are slight differences. Photoshop renders fonts in, uh, I, I don't know, some other mental way that I can't work out. So again, you, 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 you get the designs and they look great because you're looking at a photograph. Then you implement it and your client says, hang on, this is supposed to be uh, open sans, size 72, font weight, bold, line height, 34 pixels. And I open my inspector and I show them, this is exactly what is in the designs and this is exactly what I've implemented. Um, I'm not a very good developer, so I have to make sure I implement what I'm given. So you can't complain about it. And this is what happens. So, so, so the fonts get rendered, rendered differently. So you're, again, you're not handing over to the client what, what, what they think they're getting. Your, your, your pixel perfect uh, uh, design can't be pixel perfect for, for, for these kind of reasons. So here's uh, three reasons then that, that we don't use Photoshop or we don't like Photoshop. Number one is that it's not responsive. So what you, you're going to end up getting is lots of designs for desktop. Um, again, with a client we had, the, the recently, I was mentioning earlier on, we got 46 desktop designs. 52% of their traffic comes on mobile. We got six mobile designs. We got zero tablet designs. So as a front-end developer, your job then is to, okay, I can implement a mobile, I can uh, implement a desktop version, and I don't know what happens on the tablet. Do we just stretch the images more and more and more, uh, and that breaks? doesn't break layout, but it doesn't look great, so you get the exact same on, des on, on tablet as you get on, on, on mobile. Or do we do something else? Do we, do we design ourselves and say, okay, well, if there's three items in a grid on desktop and one on mobile, how about we put in two on, on tablet? And that's great, but there's the reason there, there's three is because they want to show nine results in the review. So then when we put in two in a row on tablets, we end up with one extra one at the bottom and things like that. So, you know, we're, we're not getting tablet des designs. Um, they're designed then for a specific browser size, as I mentioned a minute ago, if they're designed at 1200 pixels, you will only see them at 1200 pixels and often not see the big bleed of what happens to the hero image when, it, when, it, when, it, when the, the, the monitor is, is larger. Um, so designers are, you know, they're, they're kind of de designing these great experiences. They're about user experience and user interaction and uh, being creative, I guess. Users just want functionality. You know, the, the, Design a lovely drop down and it looks great and it's got subtle hover effects. But we've, most of our work is with government. We've got to make sure we pass WCAG 2.0 so the government signs off and a design, but the uh, drop downs aren't accessible anymore. Um, so we, we, we've got those kind of issues. So uh, you don't see them popping up in Photoshop. They're, 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 they're not a problem. Number two, I think, is uh, that designs are zoomed out. So you send your design to a client and it's maybe, we'll say, 4,000 pixels high, what the client ends up doing is zooming out because they want to get a look at the whole overall web page. Now, the point of this, I, I don't know because this is one of our own designs um, in Photoshop. <laughs> <coughs> and they zoom out completely. Their, their font is rendering at about one pixel. You can't read it. No one's going to actually look at a website like this, but for whatever reason, they want to zoom out. And the same with the, with the, the mobile designs. You can see this tiny, tiny little mobile screen and it's going way down the, down the page. So what you should be able to see here is only the header and that hero image, because that's about what you're going to be able to see on a, on a, on a, a desktop or on, a, on a, a laptop. And my favorite reason for not using something like Photoshop is that it's, it's too easy to create crazy ideas. So this is three examples. The client is anonymized because we, we like winning contracts. <laughs> um, but these are three actual requests we got from clients, uh, not necessarily when I was working with Anatech, when I was w working self-employed and that. So the first one was that we don't want to maintain an About Us page. Instead, we want that when you click on the About Us page, it will open up Wikipedia page in a color box. But Wikipedia has to be styled like our website, our, 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 our color scheme, because we can't have Wikipedia breaking our brand guidelines.
So this, if that was Drupal, when you click on the Drupal About Us page, this is the Wikipedia Drupal article and we, we played around with it yesterday. That's very easy to do in Photoshop. You know, you, 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 can, you can do that no problem and you can hand it to a designer, to the, to the developers, but no matter how much you do that in Photoshop, I still cannot change the CSS of uh, Wikipedia on the fly. Um, another reason, another example, a client came to me and said, we, we, there's a website in Ireland called Done Deal. It's basically like eBay, it's, it's an Irish version of, of that. And he said, I don't like the look of my website. He came to me first time he has an e-commerce website. And I said, no, you don't, I built your website, there's no e-commerce. Yes, I do, I have an e-commerce website. And he showed me basically eBay, where he sells his products. So I thought, hmm, that's kind of clever, okay, you've got an e-commerce website. Yes, Mark, I do, but I don't like the look of my products on it. Um, all of the things on Done Deal, their colors, their branding is red and brown. But my color scheme is blue and yellow. So can you change the look of Done Deal for me? So if we were selling Drupals, again, yeah, no problem at all, give me Photoshop and we can do that. Um, but since we're, we, we, we can't, again, same as Wikipedia, we can't edit the, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, and no amount of explaining to this client could get him to understand that I cannot change done deal, I cannot change eBay just because your designer gave you a, a Photoshop document. Um, We get the lens flare issue. You know, when you click on this button, it gets a lens flare. And, and that's fine if you want to put in, say, a transparent PNG, and you, 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 can, you can say that, okay, on, on click or on hover, on focus, that there's a, a, an after a pseudo element. But we did have a client who says, we have this hero image, and here's what the hero image has to look like, and all hero images have to look like this as well. And they have to have a alpha transparency, layer on top, it must have a gradient on top, it must have a desaturation filter, it then must recolorize the image with a kind of a blue hue to fit our brand guidelines. And we said, why can't you just upload the image that's in the, the Photoshop document? And they thought, mm, we might want to change it sometime. So we said, okay, well, for the first instance, until you do want to change it, can we upload that? No, no, we, we've got to get this done properly, we've got to get this done with CSS. So we went back to the, to the designers and said, do you have any idea how this might be done in CSS or how we might be able to implement, implement this? This is looking a bit tricky. And they said, no, that's not possible with CSS. Okay. <laughs> Where do we go from here? So it, it got to the stage that the client had no choice but to upload the, the image. So again, if you want to add some lens there when you click on try Drupal, this is what you might get. And again, you know, this, is, this is simple in Photoshop, but this is very difficult in, in, uh, in code. So what's better? Well, Sketch App is better. I'm not going to go through Sketch App because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a fantastic tool. It's great for quick mock-ups. It's great for UI uh, creating uh, interfaces and things like that. We, we, we use this internally for our designs, but then they get transferred to me to write Pattern Lab and, and, and we can send a URL to our, to our clients. But ultimately it fails for the same reasons. You're still sending static mock-ups. You're still just really sending an image to your, to your client. There's a man called Clark. Uh, Clark Valberg, I think his name is. Does anyone happen to know who he is? Okay, I'm kind of, <laughs> oh, is he here? <laughs> I'm afraid he's going to turn up some my presentation sometime. Uh, Clark doesn't like Envision. Anyone not like Envision? Brilliant, thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome to my party. So Clark is the CEO of Envision. Um, and I had a tweet a while back to say, yes, Envision, and I'm sure it's going to be a shit experience that you're loading. And Clark replied to me, unfortunately, you are correct, sir. I'm all over, expect significant improvements soon. So fair play, at least the, the CEO of Envision knows that Envision is not a good tool. Uh, and then they contacted me for a couple of weeks to see could they schedule an int interview or a chat to discuss my pain points with Envision, uh, which I declined because I see no reason to speak to them unless they have a big fat delete button <laughs> and, and feel like doing that to the, to the master repo of Envision. So then a couple of weeks ago, uh, they, they launched some new tool that does some inspect uh, thing in Envision, which is basically Sketch Online or something like that. I don't really see the point of it, but I had to sign up for it because another de design agency asked us, will you try this tool with us and see what it's like? So I signed up and I got an email from Envision. And I thought, okay, you're developing what you say is the best design tool in the world. Um, you can't make a mobile email. So, 
What's the solution? That's enough of the, of the complaints. What's the solution? Well, basically, the web was founded on HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And at some stage, we're going to have to write HTML and CSS and JavaScript, whether that's in Drupal and the render array pops it out for us, or we, we write it using something like Pattern Lab or, or some other KSS node, whatever style guide uh, generator we're going to use. But at some stage, you have to write CSS, JavaScript, and uh, HTML. So why not just do that at, at the beginning? Take, the, take, take the, the pain out of it. Instead of sending a PSD to our clients, send them a URL. Every time you want to change, you want, you want something uh, different color or whatever, they can just refresh the URL and you, they have it straight away. And they have that there then as a, as a living document for themselves. So Brad Frost, I'm sure you, you've heard of Brad Frost. He's the founder uh, of, the, of the kind of idea of atomic design. Um, he had a great blog post there a while back about building a website for uh, some politician in America, and he got the whole thing done in one week. And I thought this was a very good point from it, that designing in the browser allows you to get closer to the final product much faster. So we're, we're, we're not sending our clients this kind of approximation of what the website will look like, or we think it will be something along these lines. We're actually saying to them, this is what the website will look like. Uh, here it is with long titles and short titles. Here it is when you're logged in. Here it is when you're not logged in. Here's the different different views we have for different uh, content types. And they can see these then in, in real uh, in, in real time and on, re on real devices. So if, if you send a link to, to the designs and your client happens to open it on a phone, well, he's going to see what the website's going to look like on a phone. And if he happens to open it in a laptop, he's going to see what it looks like on a, on a desktop. So we've got five um, stages really to go, go through. Number one, discovery. This is finding out what the client wants. Um, this is great for when the client tells you all the different uh, types of unicorns that exist and what they want. And then we go to number two, research, which is where the real magic happens. When we actually talk to some users and see what do you actually need? What's, what's, what, 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 what problems are we trying to solve? And there, there's, there's quite a difference between what the client wants and what you need. So uh, again, a lot of our work with the government we need a big picture of the minister on the front page of the website. Nobody needs to see a picture of the minister on the front page of the website, but the minister wants to get elected at next election. And that's why he, he, he has to go on the front page, not because he's adding any value to the front page. What the, what the users need on the front page is a big search box. And then we can do some rapid prototyping, take out the pens, the papers, uh, post-it notes, pencils, whatever you, you need, and get your information architecture and things worked out. And then do some more rapid prototyping in something like maybe Balsamic or Sketch or Photoshop if, if, if you must. Um, and, and that can get the design going. And I don't mind designers using these, these tools. My problem is when we send that on to the client. So you get the design going and, uh, and you, you get a component finished so you, you, you know what the header is going to look like. Well, when you know that, tell me and I'll write the HTML, CSS and JavaScript and we'll have a header designed and the client can sign off the header from a browser, not from an image that, that we're going to send to them. So we agree on the different components then, and we, we, we can, we can, we can um, team them up. And we use an atomic design approach. Um, I'm going to guess that at this stage you, you, people have a fair idea, so I'll kind of skip through this. So, but it's based that we go through what we call atoms, molecules, organisms, templates, and pages. So an atom is something that's the smallest unit of HTML, like uh, an input field or a button and a molecule is when you get more than one atom and put those together so you get the input field and you get the uh, button you put those together and that becomes a search block and an organism then is when you get a couple of molecules and put those together so you, you get the search block and you get the branding block and you get a menu and you put those together and that makes a header and you get a template so you get a header and you get a footer and you get a main section and you get a sidebar and that, that makes a template, and then the page is the actual colors and the fonts and the, the real content going into it. So here's what we do then. We, we, we have Pattern Lab. The version we use is the version created by phase two, um, simply because that was the first version I think that, that was released. I'm, I'm going to start looking at Emulsify and some of the other versions as well to see what, what we can learn from them. Um, so we create all the components in Pattern Lab. We then map these one-to-one -one, uh, from the Drupal team, so we could say that the node-teaser.html.twig file maps to the uh, teaser.twig teaser inside Pattern Lab. Um, and then the client will see these designs eventually, and when they see them, and they sign off them, and say, these look great, they're actually signing off then on the front end. We've got the front end built. So the, the, the design process is actually the Drupal teaming process. So rather than going through uh, discovery, back-end, site-building, design, then uh, front-end. We get, we get the QA for the front-end done up front, and when we're finished, 
they've got two things. Number one, the team is signed off, so we're, we're working quicker than we, we would be working with Photoshop. And number two, they've got themselves a style guide. So we don't even ask them, do you want a style guide? How much would a style guide cost? Well, maybe 10,000 euros for three weeks work or something like that. We don't even bother asking our clients, do you want a style guide? Because when you use Pattern Lab, we can't not give them a style guide. That's just, that's what Pattern Lab does. It, it, it automatically builds it for us. Um, okay, so here's an example then and of the, each, each of these examples I'll go through, the things on the top is Pattern Lab, the things on the bottom is uh, Drupal. So this is just a very simple one of a menu and I put in five menu items, home, about us, our work, blog and contact and gave one of the, the menu items a class of uh, is active or something, something like that. And then the bottom one is the Drupal implementation and you can see that we have six menu items instead of five and the design doesn't break and we can add in more and short client, this is what it would be like with seven items but the, the design is still the exact same Pixel for pixel, color for color, padding, margins, everything is 100% is, is, is identical. So if the client was to sign off on the menu in the, in the top one, we know that just we can't not give them the exact same design in the bottom one. And if you were to make something like a header, again, you can see on the left-hand side of the top image, it says ENGA, that's for English and Guelga. Uh, again, a lot of our websites in Ireland for the government would have to, have to be multilingual in Irish and English. Um, so we, we, we got that language switcher there, we got the logo then in the middle and we've got the menu on the right hand side and on the Drupal implementation the client decided that we don't want EN and GA, we want the words English and Guelga for accessibility reasons. So they can change that, no problem, and the design doesn't break. Um, you, know, you, you don't get that kind of flexibility when you're working with something like Drupal. Um, so we go a bit further then uh, towards looking at a node. And again this is a node page from the this winter ready website. So on the left hand side we've got uh, our default data that we pull in via JSON and we've got some, uh, a, an image which it doesn't matter what the image is, all we were worried about here is that we have the image dimensions and the client can see an image will be going there. And you can see the Drupal version of then, it's the exact same, uh, the style is the same, the size is the same. So we, we, we can't, again, we can't not give the client the design that they're, they're signing off on. So to do this, um, as I said earlier on, I'm not a very good developer and I'm a lazy developer and I don't know enough clever things to be able to do things cleverly and I don't know how, to, how I would write the Drupal menu system in Pattern Lab. So what I did instead was I took menu.html.twig and copied and pasted it into Pattern Lab. So I thought, I can't go wrong. I, I have the exact same markup now that Drupal has. And when I did that then in my Drupal templates, so I've got say, two directories, one called components or called Pattern Lab and one called templates, and the templates is the Drupal templates. I then go to my templates folder and I get menu.html.twig, and you can see there on the top uh, right, and I say that, that you will find the HTML for this inside the directory called atoms slash menu slash horizontal menu slash horizontal menu dot twig. And that's, that's as simple as that. You're really just uh, swapping one set of templates for, for another. So if you look at then at the branding block again, what we've done here is, actually this is the, the default code that comes with the, with the phase two pattern lab team. So what, what phase two did here was just wrote the HTML that you're going to get back from Drupal into their branding block um, that hit that twig file. And then for that I, I go to my branding block that twig file in my templates folder and I've said what you're going to do here is extend rather than include uh, the, the block that HTML that twig file and inside that file, you'll, you'll see a block called content, as in a twig block. And there, where we have a variable called URL, which links back to the home page of the Pattern Lab installation, you use that for that variable, will you use uh, angle brackets front, so it'll link to the front page of the website instead of the front page of the style guide. So again, we're, we're, we're extending from one template uh, to another, and then swap a, swap a variable. Okay, if we got slightly more complex then, we can look at the header. So the header is an organism. Um, so again, wh what we're doing here is we put in the, the header HTML that we're gonna expect to get back from Drupal, and then we just include the three different blocks that, that we need for, for, for the header. So in this case, we've included the molecule called branding, that's the branding block, the molecule called language switcher, and the molecule called uh, superfish menu. And when we have those three in there, and we've seen just a moment ago from here, what the HTML is going to be like. So that, that means then inside our block PL uh, block, 
we'll get the exact same HTML that Drupal was, was, was going to give us. And what I've done then is on the left hand side, I've got a, a block called block PL. This is where I say I'm not very clever. And that's what you see in Pattern Lab. And then under that, I've got a block called uh, block Drupal. And this is what you're going to see in Drupal. So the block Drupal in Pattern Lab is empty. And on the right hand side, in the Drupal header.twig file, I make the block Pattern Lab empty and I print the content. So whatever blocks get placed in the header in Drupal will get rendered in the header in, in, in the team. Then we had some issues with attributes and uh, in terms of accessibility and, and things like that to get all the area attributes and to know if, if things are, are open or closed and node IDs and classes. So to make sure that, that would work, I just added the attributes um, item into my pattern lab so that when I extend uh, from, from Drupal to pattern lab and it, it reads that HTML attributes is, is al already there. So if you're looking for attributes, uh, uh, add class or attributes, uh, node title and things like that, in my JSON, I've just created a default um, uh, item, item in, in that. So this one here is slightly more co uh, complex. This is, this is looking at a paragraph bundle, uh, specifically a paragraph bundle that would create a card. So the card has an image field, a title field, a small text field, and a link field. On the left-hand side in Pattern Lab, uh, we, we, we put our if statements data, if there's a title, print the title, if there's an image, print the image. So this will allow the editors to, to not have an image if they want, or to not have a title or if, 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 if they so, so choose. Then in Drupal, where it gets a little bit more complex, is that what I've said is the four code blocks at the top, I'm checking for a value first. So I'm saying that check if the image field has a value. And if it does have a value, create a new variable. And the variable will, will, will be called a car title or card image. And then the second block there, then I've said is that you will find the HTML for this paragraph hyphen hyphen card dot HTML dot twig. You will find that in the organisms folder, uh, building blocks slash card slash card dot twig. And then swap the variable that we call title in card for card title, which is the variable we created just a second ago in the top block, and swap image for card image and, and things like that. So that, that then allows the editors to not use an image if they wish to not use an image or not use a title if they wish to not use a title, but we don't end up getting empty divs rendered on the page. And then if we were to do this with a node, it's pretty much the same again. We, we uh, pop out pretty much the HTML we're going to be expecting to get back from Drupal. And then we tell the node template, so node-teaser.html.twig, that you'll find the code for this up in uh, the organisms content type guide, guide.twig file. And then swap what we call the body in that field for content.body, swap image for content.field image. And again, that, that renders back then the HTML that, that, that we've already been expecting from Pattern Lab. So why is this good? I mean, it's, 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 it's easy to do. Uh, it does take a bit of conceptualizing how you're doing it. And uh, you're kind of, if you're used to Drupal and the modular approach, you, you should get the theoretical framework fairly quickly. But it, it does take a bit of work trying to work out what your general pattern is. Um, but so why is it still good? Why, first thing, I think it's, it's sustainable. What we have on the left here is the Photoshop way of doing things. So a client doesn't like the background colors, the designer needs to open up every single Photoshop file and go and change the background color of all the different buttons. Now I know you can do some clever-ish things that might make that a bit less painful, but that's the general thing. And the designer charges by the hour so he can retire young. Here's what we do in uh, component-based uh, style guide driven development. The client doesn't like the background color on the buttons. The developer changes the dot button class to be red instead of blue. And the URL then automatically gets updated and the client can see, see, the, see the new work. That takes you know 10 seconds, 15 seconds. So uh, there's a minimal cost and the developer needs to get a second job to pay the mortgage. Why is this so good? Uh, part two, it's so good because we get QA done quickly. So I'm, I'm gonna guess like us, we talk to our clients and we say we want things tested continuously throughout the project and we're working in an agile manner and as we finish each component and you, you, you test that and you sign that off and they always say yes and then no testing gets done until the project's finished. And they tell us we don't want to test individual components, we want to test whole pages or we want to test whole site sections. So the designer designs the website, the developers build the website, it's not exactly what the client wants or they realize there's some issues that they're, 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 they didn't factor in because of the designs. They do some QA, they report some bugs, the bugs get fixed. The client tests again. <laughs> More bugs reported. 
we eventually get it, get it, get it fixed, and everyone's, everyone's happy, and we get a sign-off. And that, that process takes time. If we take a style guide approach to this, <clears throat> the designer will design the website in the browser, the client will look at this on real devices, and as many clients as, as they want can look at them, and as many devices as they want to look at, look at them, and then the QA becomes part of the design process. So as they sign off the design and say, yeah, this is what we want you to develop, they're signing off the front-end QA. So you, you can still do all your QA in terms of your, the back-end has to be done, the Drupal website needs to be built and things like that, but we, we're signing off basically the, the, the front-end QA. Uh, so the finished design then is the finished front-end. And then we get, get to, to the idea of a living style guide. So like I said, we don't ask clients, do you want a living style guide? We just give them a living style guide. Um, there's probably going to be a question in a minute when, when we open up the questions uh, along the lines of how do you sell this to your clients? How do you sell Pattern Lab to your clients? How do you, how do you convince your boss that you want to use Pattern Lab? And the basic answer is you, 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 don't, you don't care what your boss thinks about your desire to use Pattern Lab or not because your boss doesn't know you're using Pattern Lab. They're not the front end developers. Uh, no client will ever come to you and say, yeah, we, we want a website developed and you must use Bartik as your base team. Um, you know, the, the client doesn't care what base team we're using and they're trusting us to use, to use the correct one. So again, I, I, I don't tell my boss, I'm going to start using Pattern Lab and it's going to be great and I'm going to spend 16 weeks convincing you because to be honest, and <laughs> I do talk to her, <laughs> she's still not convinced that we should use Pattern Lab. <laughs> uh, so that, that can be hard, so, so I would say don't. So, but, but what you're doing then is just use what you want to use, and if, if Pattern Lab is the correct choice for you, use that, or KSS Node is, or if uh, Fractal is, or wh which, whichever you, you want to use. And then you're, you're going to give a living style guide to, to uh, your clients. So if they want to design a new page, they can look at your components, and you can say, these are the components you have. There is no more. What do you want the page to look like based on these components? And you can drop four or five bits of HTML into a Pattern Lab file and show them instantly this is what your new page is going to look like. Um, so this happened to us a while ago. We got, um, like I say, 46 PSDs. One of them was called styleguide.psd. <laughs> then we got some final design.psd hyphen updated dot final, <laughs> dot PSD, <laughs> which had some changes uh, to colors, and we were implemented the style guide version, because we presumed the style guide is a canonical document, and then the client told us, no, we need to change these to these colors, and we said, but hang on, the style guide says this, this says this, and what you're asking for now is actually something different, which is the canonical source, and the client didn't know. So you're under pressure when the client doesn't know what they actually do want, and you don't have that problem with, with, with something like Pattern Lab, because there can only be one source and every time the code gets updated, gets updated, the style guide automatically gets updated. So again, I'll, I'll skip through these. What, what, what you're doing then really is that you know, when it's just a URL, any updates are instantaneous. So it's good for regression testing. It means we can use what we call real content. I'm going to guess there's going to be questions about this in a minute, so I'll help you out as well. Uh, what we call real content uh, in terms of, say, 10 blog posts, and we can put in a body field of different lengths in each of those, and different length and titles, and different images. But we don't use live content. So we, we don't pull in a JSON feed from the actual website. We could do that, but we, we don't. And the reason we don't is for re, uh, regression testing. So if we want to test the views listing page for news, and we're using live content, every time we try to do a regression test, it's going to fail because there's new news posts on the page. So when we use, we use real but dummy content, let's say, um, actual content from the website that that won't be changing, so that our regression test will pass because we're, we're testing against the exact same uh, news page all the time. Or you know, if there's an events page and the dates are changing, well, if, if we use static content, this doesn't happen. Oh yeah, I had a joke there, I'm after skipping it, oh well. <laughs> so the CEO has had a heart attack <laughs> because he's designed a new component and the new component breaks something else he realizes after three weeks. When, when we use, uh, regression testing and we use something like Pattern Lab and Pattern Lab is a great, uh, I, I can't think of what it's called, it's inheritance or something like that, that when you look at any component it tells you that this component here is made up of these other components and this is automatically ge generated for you. So if you want to change a component, you know what other components need to go back and regression test and then tells you every component you have, it then tells you that this component is used in a higher up one. So it tells you that the branding block is used in the header and it tells you that the header is made up of the branding block plus the search block. 
So when a new component then gets added, we can test against this, we can make sure that the website doesn't break, and then three weeks later the CEO is in good health. Probably retiring early with the designers. So that's, that's, the, that's the basic uh, discussion around what we're trying to do and what I'm trying to promote in terms of, of uh, not using static generators, not using static um, design tools, and instead using, using things like Pattern Lab, using things like, like Fractal. Uh, Drupal Camp Dublin is on next month, the 20th and 21st of October. It would be great if some of you could come along. It's only 20 euros for a ticket. We're only charging this year for the first time because we find if we don't charge money, lots of people sign up and don't come. Uh, <laughs> if you can't afford 20 euros, talk to me and I'm sure we can get you a ticket. There's contribution sprints on. Uh, we're obliged to put this up, so please have a read of it and go to sprints if you can and help out. Uh, whatever, whatever, whatever you can. And if you'd like to review this session, click like or heart or favorite or share or whatever it is you do, you'll find a, a comment form on the link for this page. So, is everybody happy? Do you have any questions? I'm happy. No, I explained it too well, or not well enough. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, great uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, agree with everything, but I'm still having trouble understanding, like, how do we convince designers to use these tools? Um, because uh, it, it seems to me that you became the designer when, uh, but how do you know what to design, what to make? Um, I'm, I'm a front-end developer, so <coughs> I, I get okay. the Photoshop designs and yep. all the crap with that. But I, uh, the problem I'm having <laughs> is that I can't convince designers to like switch tools, like learn new tools to m make it uh, for websites. Is, is this the solution for that problem or? What I used to say was, fire your designers. That, uh, that des designers are clever people, you know. Uh, if they can work out how to use something like Photoshop, they can work out how to write HTML and CSS and at least rudimentary JavaScript in terms of, you know, show height type stuff or slide toggle. Um, I've stopped saying that. I, 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 one of our, our friends' companies, another Drupal company, I, I, I had a quite a discussion with him about his wife, telling him that his wife is not a web designer, his wife is a graphic designer that happens to be designing websites. Uh, so I don't go that far anymore. I, I, I don't want to insult people, um, mm -hmm. and, it's, and I don't think you can. You, I don't think you can uh, <clears throat> convince designers to not use what they want to use. So instead, now what we say is, okay, if you want to use Photoshop to design, that's fine. Just don't send those to the client. Don't send the client to PSD. Uh, don't send them a PDF. <clears throat> so use Photoshop if you want to design, or use Sketch. Whatever gets you designing the best website as quickly as possible. At some stage, I have to write the HTML and CSS and JavaScript. So before you send that to the client, give it to me. I'll do that part of it, and then we'll send a link to the client. So we let the designer design with the tools that they, they want to use, and we get the front end written as quickly as possible. Oh, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what did you do when the client want to completely change the front page? After the first design, it said, oh, no, I don't want that. Uh, maybe you can do some, something different. Do you redo all the stuff? In That's what you do, yeah. 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 It's no different if you use Photoshop, they don't like it. You've got to get your big, juicy delete button and yeah. start using it. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, if the client doesn't like it, you, you design again. Okay. Um, one thing that, 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 that we do hope will, will work out in our favor in the coming years would be that we'll, we'll have different design patterns from different websites, and a client might say that we like the, the header style of your, we we'll say, Oxfam website, and we like the slider that you have on the Irish Cancer Society website, and we could just take those components from Pattern Lab and drop them into their new, new site and change the colors then to match their, their branding, and that would be, mean that we could design very, very quickly, and it's already, it's already regression tested and things, things like that. Um, but yeah, if the client doesn't like it, you've got to go back to designing again. I, I don't see a, a solution for that. <clears throat> uh, 
just um, uh, I arrived to the session just a few minutes late, so uh, forgive me if I'm asking you something that you already replied on the presentation. Sure. But I think besides the problem of the markup itself, I uh, see it raises potential problems on the sales process, if you know what I mean. That you have to you show your work to the client. Uh, for example, uh, you can have clients that say, uh, what's all those for? You, the website is actually uh, finished. Why do you need uh, three more weeks to finish that? It mm -hmm. doesn't understand the gap between the mock-up and the finished website, for example, or signing a deal, because if you do that a sophisticated mock-up, you're essentially working for free unless you have deal, uh, you have a deal signed in advance. And to get the deal signed in advance, you need something to sell. And I don't know, how do you deal with those yeah, well, it's, it's, problems in the sales process? It, it's it's been, our, been in our contracts. When, when we write a tender and the section on design, we say that we'll be designing in the browser and we'll be using a, 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 a website generator and that you'll be getting a URL. So we, we, we tell them specifically that you will not be getting any Photoshop documents. You will not get any sketch files. You, you'll get a URL. You can try some kind of education process on the client to understand the... Yeah, well, we, we, have, we have the onboarding session, so we, we, we go through to the client that this is an example of Pattern Lab for a different client, and here's the different things, and they, they can see how it works. And then we send them bit by bit, here's some design components for a listing page, here's some design components, and they can, they can sign, sign, sign them off. Okay, you show the process first with that different example. Yeah, it, 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 does, it does take a bit of, uh, they're not used to this kind of approach, so it, it, it takes some, uh, not necessarily selling their approach to them because they've already, we've already won the contract and, and they've agreed that this is what we're going to do. But just, just some education to let them know that how it actually works in the real world. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How do you deal with typography beyond headings? Like if you had a field label and a tag that looked just the same, would you create a component for that? Maybe mixing, just not reusing? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, how do you deal with typography, like different the, textiles, not yeah. just for headings, but maybe if you had a field label and a tag that looked just the same, would you create a component called maybe uppercase small text or just mixing maybe? Yeah, you, you, you have to just create um, create classes that are, that are say, you, you have, we have base files, which, 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 which would allow us to do things like spacings and margins and uh, text float left, text float right, and things like that. Um, you can pop those classes then into into whatever component you're using, so so they, they wouldn't get styled necessarily at at the individual component level if you're going to need need to reuse them. So they they get styled in a utilities directory at the at the root level. Okay, another quick question. Okay. What do you use our, uh, as your base theme? Uh, the Pattern Lab, the Pattern Lab Phase Two version we use, as far as I know, doesn't have a base theme. It's 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 it all runs on itself. Let's say. Um, when I'm working myself as, for a base team, we, we've, we've team we're, we're progressing towards, let's say, Pattern Lab. So we have another base team that, that, that we use, we call the weather team, because in Ireland the weather changes a lot, so it's changeable like the weather. Uh, and that uses Classy as a base team. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm a developer, so you were talking about uh, testing. What uh, do you use uh, for testing uh, designs? Uh, backstop. Back? Backstop. Okay, thank you. It's a backstop JS. It's, it's, it, it runs with uh, things on Phantom. Uh, it's a headless thingy. I don't know a huge amount about that part. But, uh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>